today I'm going to be showing you how to make a range of food packets, tins and jars for your doll's house kitchen. I just wanted to begin by talking a little bit about scale. So I've got here some miniatures that I've had in my collection for a little while and here are the full sized equivalents. So if we start off for example with this little box of icing sugar. So the height of that is 20 millimetres. So if we were to times that by 12 that would be 240 millimetres or nine and a half inches high. And then if we measure the icing sugar, that's just under six and a quarter inches high. So if I just pan back a bit and show you, if I hold my finger where the size of the 12th scale one would be, so my thumb there on the rule, is how tall the 12th scale equivalent would be. So as you can see, it's half the size again. So that little box is, really isn't going to work. So I'll pop that one to one side. And if I measure the tin there, that's 11 millimetres high, the 12th scale tin. So times that by 12 would be 132 millimetres. So that would be 5 and 1 eighth of an inch. But if we measure the tin, it's 110 millimetres. So about four and a quarter inches. So that tin is a little bit too big, but you can buy larger sizes. Although I would recommend just using those maybe in a, a shop setting as a catering size pack. I think in a doll's house, certainly in the cupboard that I've built for my food, that would probably look a little bit out of scale. So again, I'm going to put that to one side. So let's have a look at this little box of Coleman's mustard here. And that's 10 millimetres high. So that would be 120, so four and a quarter inches high. And again, it's, it's half the size again of the actual tin. And I quite like that as well, but I think that's going to look a bit, little bit out of scale. So here I've got some sauce and little sauce bottle there is 21 millimetres high so that would be 252 millimetres or 10 inches high and that bottle there is just under 7 inches high and finally the flower this is a box and I've got a bag there now that's 25 millimetres high so that would be a foot high so as tall as this ruler so let's measure the bag and I've sort of pulled up the top so it's as high as it will go and as you can see that would be a really massive bag of flour. So I was really happy with these little miniatures before I did this exercise but now I see that they are going to look out of scale. So there's lots of people out there selling um, miniature packaging and most of it is going to be the correct sizing. So the idea of this isn't to say don't buy pre-printed, pre-folded miniatures, but it's just really to check the sizes. So always just go into your kitchen cupboard, measure the height of things and then reduce that by 12 and then have a look at the height on the website and they should all give at least a height of a box. And if they don't, it might just be worth asking them. But one thing I'm actually going to recommend is just having a go at making your own. Not only can you then get the sizes correct, but also it works out a lot less expensive. So let me show you how to do that. And one really good way of doing it is by collecting packaging from your own food cupboards. So boxes, packets, labels, wrappers, any sort of clean packaging that you can easily salvage and I save all of my card anyway because as you know I use it for dispensing my glue onto and for other smaller projects as well so that's a really good habit to get into. For this method you'll need a scanner and a printer and a photo editing program such as Adobe Photoshop. We'll start with this Alpen cereal box as an example. So begin by opening it all out and flattening it. And if you've got a smaller box or piece of packaging, then you can even cut 
along one of the joins and flatten it out completely. When I placed the box in the scanner it didn't quite fit so just part of it was just overhanging the edge of the scanning area. So I scanned in each side of the box separately and saved them as front, back, left side and right side. Now with this particular box there's no need to worry about the flaps at the top and bottom because what we're actually going to do now is make a little background to put all of these pieces on and join them together and then when we print it off we can cut it out leaving a border to make a top and bottom which will then fold around our wood or card or whatever we're going to wrap this around. The next thing to do is to actually measure the box. Now on Photoshop you can actually click a box that says constrain proportions so all you'll actually need from this packaging is one measurement and I'm going to take the height of the box not including the flaps and that is 240 millimeters so that's nice and easy then to divide by 12 so in 1 12th scale that will make the box 20 millimeters so you're just dividing the measurement by 12 so then I come back to my images and I'm going to start with this front part of the box. So from the toolbar up here I select image and image size and then in here you can see I've set here the width and height to centimetres and you've got other options in there. In this case we want to use centimetres and I'm going to change the height to 2 centimetres and that's our 20 millimetres and as you can see the width there just changed automatically because I've got this box down here ticked constrain proportions so if you were to untick that box and then change let's just change the height to 9 centimetres everything else will stay the same or the width stays the same and then obviously you'd have a misshapen box so you always want to make sure that is ticked and then this sizes it accordingly so two centimeters and also here the resolution I've set to 300 and that's 300 pixels per inch and that will give you a clearer image so I'll then click OK and you then want to do that with each image Obviously if you're just doing a um, single box, you managed, you've got a smaller box and you've managed to flatten it out completely, then we, you would just take one measurement, again you could do the height or you could do all the way across and then you just change that size accordingly and print it off. So these are all my reduced sized images but I've just done fit to screen so that you can see a bit easier. And what I want to do now is join them all together. So I want to create a new file. So I'll go up to file and new. And then you can actually choose the size. So we know that the box is 20 millimeters high or 2 centimeters. So I've chosen a height of 3 centimeters. So I've got a bit of a border at the top and bottom. And then I've chosen a width of 6. And again, when you do the new file, you want the resolution to be the same as it was for your original image. So again, I've set that to 300 pixels. So press OK. And there's our new file. And we then want to choose a colour for our background. So you take the little dropper tool over on this little taskbar here. And you can actually pick up a colour from your image. So I'm going to go for that nice dark blue at the bottom there. And then I'm going to click on the little paint bucket and fill the new file with colour. And then you want to go to your little arrow tool. And then we're just going to lay them onto the new file. And I've got plenty of room there, as you can see, at the top and bottom. So that's one side. I then want to take the back. And I'm just sort of roughly lining them up for now because when I zoom in we'll be able to get an exact match along that join there. And then I want to take the other side. And that will go there. And then the front. And that will go there. I think thinking about it, this is so much bigger, this file, because 
This is pixels per centimetre and on my original one it was pixels per inch. So that's why that looks so tiny on this new file. But that's okay because we're going to cut it down anyway. So you can then reduce the size, leaving a good border around your image. Press enter. So close up we can see that there's quite a bit of gap in there. So you just come on back onto your arrow tool and then down here at the side you'll see the layers. So each of those bits I put on, so the side, back, side and front has been given a layer name. So I want to go back to layer 1 which was the first image I put in and then that allows me to move that. And I'll click on layer tool 2 and instead of using the little finger tool I'm actually going to use the arrow tool actually on the keyboard which I find is more precise and you just want to butt them up like that so go in a little bit like that and then I want to go on to layer 3 which is the next side and again I'll use the little arrow Finally, the front. And then once you've got it to that stage, you can do a little bit of fine-tuning. But what you need to do first of all is make this all into one layer. Because as I just spoke about, these are all separate layers at the moment. So if you tried to do any editing, you would just be editing one layer at a time. So again, from your toolbar at the top, you would choose Layer and flatten image and that then makes it all into one piece and then you can go in and make some adjustments so there's a little bit of white showing here along this join which was obviously a little tear in the box so I can zoom in on that and you see how it goes all sort of pixely when you go in close but because this image is going to be so small that's not going to be noticeable so I'm just picking a really s small tool here See it moving up and down there, that little circle. So I'm going to select a bit of colour and then I can get rid of that little white mark there. Now I'm not going to spend too much time on this because like I say it's, it's going to be so so tiny and in a cupboard and hardly any of that is going to be noticeable. But if you've got any sort of big marks on there or even a tear that you wanted to correct then that's the way you would do it. And again, I've got these white lines here down the joins, but I think that will actually look quite natural when it's all folded up. So I'm now going to save this as a JPEG. I'm going to call it Alpen Box Complete, so I know that that's the, the full image. I can then save that. And then I'm going to close that down. And then I'm going to start work on another image. So the next image I've got here is an Earl Grey tea box. And this one was a lot easier because I was just able to cut along one side and the whole thing then fitted into my scanner. So that makes it easier. And the height at 12 scale is 11.5 millimetres high. So I've already scaled that down. And now I want to make a background for it. So it's set at the same... Uh, measurements I used for the Alpen box, so I'll leave that, that will give me a good border. Press OK, and then I need to choose a colour for the top and bottom flaps. So I'll go for this nice purpley grey at the bottom here, and then fill the new file, and then let's drag that over like that. Then I no longer need that first image. to move that into the centre a bit more but I am going to trim it down a little bit so it's always better to leave more than you think you'll need because you can obviously cut around it and you're going to need more at the top and bottom on this particular box to make the flaps and at the side I just want a little bit to tuck in to glue it together so I just do it like that And I'll save that one. 
So I've got here some icing sugar and again just because of the size I had to cut that in half. So we're really just doing the same thing that we did for the Alpen box and we're going to join these two together and then put them onto a background. So first of all the size and at 1 12th scale that would be 14 millimetres high so that's 1.4 centimetres. And the same with the back. I'll just stick to the same size file each time for the background, just makes it easier. Let me make these fit to screen. And then for the flaps, I'm going to pick up that lovely pink. And then drag my images over. I can then close those down. the image, fit to screen and then I can actually oops, go onto the arrow and then I can join those up like that. I'm just going to take a little bit off the sides there. So here I've taken a label from a tin, and again nice and easy because that just fits easily below the scanner. So let me just change the image size. And this time I went width ways, and again that was 20 millimeters, so that will be two centimeters. Now on this one, I'm not going to need um, flaps at the top and bottom, so that could just be saved as it is. And I can add that onto my sheet for printing off and just cut that out as it is. Now with this muffin cases box, I scanned in the whole thing, so including all of the flaps. And I actually want to keep it as a complete box. So I want to fold it all up when I've printed it off. And then I want, actually want to put some muffin cases inside. So I just did the same thing again and measured the sort of long one of the longest edges so from the flap right up to the flap on the lid there and that's the height that I did the two halves and then I've joined them together down here so that's another way of doing it if you actually want to fold a box that you want to put something into so once you've resized all of your packets we can now print them off and I'm going to do a new file again and I want this one to be the size of an A4 sheet so I've made it 21 wide by 29 centimetres high and again 300 resolution. And then you just want to drag each of your images onto the sheet. Leave a bit of space between them so we've got room for cutting them out. I'm closing them down as I've done them. So I know which ones I've done. You can then flatten that down to make one image and then I'm going to print that off and I want to use the best um, quality settings on the printer. So I'm going to put it to print quality high and I just want to make sure I'm in colour. I was in grayscale there so put that back to colour and then print and you can always do a grayscale sort of low quality print first just to make sure that everything's looking okay so I'll press OK there I'll go back to medium so that's everything I've done so far now printed off and then I've cut around them and with the boxes you'll have far more background than you need but leave it all there and then when we come to construct them we can cut away what we don't need and it's always better to have too much there than not enough to fit around.
the piece of wood or box or whatever you're going to stick them around so that's those and then again with the tins although we don't put them onto a background when you cut them out just leave a little flap at the end there and that will just help to stick it down when we come to wrap it around the dowel and I'm actually going to start with the tins so making the tins is really simple and we're just going to wrap the labels around a piece of five millimeter dowel and that's 13 64ths of an inch. So measure your label from top to bottom and then cut your dowel so it's just a little bit longer. So I've just cut it half a millimetre longer than my label or higher than my label. And that's just so that we can see that little bit of silver rim at the top and bottom of the label. So once you've cut your dowel, use a piece of medium grade sandpaper just to smooth around the cut edges. And you can slightly bevel them inwards as you're doing it. So for the top and bottom of the tins I'm using my Humbrol enamel number 11 metallic silver paint. So I've got here my number 2 detail brush. I've got some tweezers to actually hold the dowel with and you can just hold them in the middle like that because we only need to paint the top and bottom. And then I've just got a plastic bowl here which I'm going to stand the pieces of dowel on once I've painted them. And I've given this paint a really good stir and you need to do that because all the sediment and all the metallic material will just stick at the bottom and you'll just get a dull flat grey paint. So you want to do the top and bottom but you can come down onto the sort of front edge of the tin. And that way when we put our label on there won't be any natural wood showing. I'm just going to lay that on there. Now you may have seen my craft shed video where I made lots of accessories to go in there. And I did some tins of paint and things. And with those I actually used... Um, some little circles of aluminium which I stuck on the top and bottom. So that's another way of doing it if you prefer. Just to give that illusion that it's a, you know a tin can. And These might seem quite small to you but like I said at the beginning a lot of the ones that you buy are, are really big so I know you can get really big catering sized tins and things but do just have a think about that because if they're in like your kitchen or something then chances are they're just going to be normal household size tins. So always have a think about the size. So I'm now going to leave those to dry and I'll probably leave those dry in overnight and we can now make a start on the packets. So take your first packet, I'm going to start with this Alpen box and just trim it off along one edge And then at the other edge you want to leave a flap, probably as wide again as one of your sides. So just cut that off like that. Get rid of those scraps. And then bring in your rule and we're going to fold it along each edge or each fold. So you just pull up your paper like that and then crease it along the edge of your wool. And then you can fold it down like that. And this just gives us nice neat edges. Make sure you're right along the fold when you do it, otherwise you'll have a sort of skew whiff box. And then fold along that little flap that we've left as well, and the edge of the box. And you want to make those folds along the top and bottom as well. And then bring in your scissors and you want to snip to create flaps. So you want to go first along that front edge there. 
right in that bottom corner and then at the bottom of the sides and then at the bottom of that final flap there so that you're actually making it into a little box if I fold those ones up you can see what we're doing there do the same along the other edge and then you want to measure your front so width and height and then the thickness of your side and that will be the size of the piece of wood or card that we're then going to wrap this around and I find that actually wrapping it around something makes it look more solid now I am actually going to use wood as I've got a lot of little scraps of wood that I can use but you can use card if you've got a nice firm card or mount board or foam board or anything like that but just something that's going to give you a nice solid box so I've cut out all of my packets now and a little piece of wood for each and I've just used little scraps of sheet wood, some strip wood I've stuck a couple of pieces of strip wood together there but just anything that makes up the size that you need and then you just want to apply glue to your label or your packet place your scrap of wood or card onto the paper like that a little bit of the flap come off there and then just wrap it around and then you want to fold in your flaps and just remember when you're folding in the flaps make the flap at the front edge always the last one that you fold over and that will keep your front visible edge a lot neater so then apply glue to the top of your insert whatever you've used there you might just need to trim some of the flap off in and then you can apply a little bit of glue to that final flap fold that down and then do the same along that top edge There's our first packet. So do that with each packet. I'm just taking care this time not to get it onto the front of the packet and tear it like I did with the other one. So I'm just going to apply it to the actual face of the packet and not the flaps. And this piece is just five millimeters, so I'm just using a piece of strip. around and again that's my front flap there so I'm going to stick that down last trim that off a little bit so there are the ones I've done so far I think they look really nice. Now the little pucker tea label actually ironically went a little bit puckered <laughs> so I pulled it off and put it back on but it doesn't look right so I'm going to reprint that one and I'll redo that. Another way to colour the lids for your cylindrical items is to use pencil and I'm going to do that for my Horlicks pot and that would have actually had like a little lid on top so I've just cut the piece of dowel just about a millimetre and a half taller than my piece of paper and I'm just going to colour this in and it's just quick and easier really than using paint and you also haven't got to wait for it to dry 
So go round a couple of times, make sure that you've got a good coverage. And then you can just stick your label around it, same as we're going to do for the tins. Just make sure that's the right way up. So I've got the lid in the right place. I'm just going to trim the paper off at the back. Of that side as well. And there you've got another really easy little pot. I like that one. So here I've got like a little bag of granola, so I'm going to start by making that into a little bag shape, just with an open top. Squeeze that together at the bottom and then I'm actually going to put some sesame seeds in there to fill it out. only need a few. I'd normally use a little funnel but I'm just going to use my fingers because I really do only need to put a few in there. A couple of little pinchfuls. And then I can glue that together at the top. I'm just going to use my nail to actually pinch along that top line. And then you can sort of shape the bottom of that so that it will sit nicely on your shelf. And I'm just going to trim away those little corners of the packet there. sure you don't actually cut into the pack. There we have a little bag of granola. I've got here a little muffin cases box that I was able to fit under the scanner so I've included all of the flaps. So this is just a straightforward packet that I can then fold up into shape and tuck in the flaps as you would in the real size box. So sometimes you'll be able to do that. Now I have only just used my 120 GSM paper but if you're doing boxes where you're just going to fold them without wrapping them around card or wood then you might be better off using a thicker paper or even a thin card and that will help keep them like really solid. Now on this, I don't even know if you can see it um, on camera because it's so small but there's a little window in the front of the box obviously so you can see the muffin cases through there so I'm just going to cut that out with my knife just really carefully so you don't tear the paper and this is one of those little tiny details that will be hardly noticeable when this is in place but it's a really nice little detail to include of that and then here I've got a tiny little piece of acetate and this is quite thin acetate that I kept from I'll show you here this was just like a, a the lid of a, a gift set or something so it's quite thin and it's really worth keeping all of these sort of packaging acetates and things that you get from you know toiletry sets or food packaging and things like that to use for these little projects and I'm just going to stick that little bit of acetate on the inside of that window there. I should have got my tweezers out for this, but I'll see if I can do it with my fingernails. Stick that on there like that. I 
just let that dry off for a moment and I want to have a go at actually making some muffin cases to go inside there so let's have a go. So to make the muffin cases I'm using these little sticky markers. I like the colours of these. So just peel one of those off and then use a hole punch and take the bottom of it off so you can see where you're actually punching. Just do three of each like that for now. And then you'll need something with a flat bottom, so either a paintbrush or a little piece of dowel. And I'm using this spindle, bottom of the spindle. So press the spindle into the little circle. And then you want to fold up the edges. So you're really just shaping it around the end of your piece of dowel or whatever you're using. And they don't have to be perfect, we're just sort of giving the indication of little muffin cases in there. Pop that there, do the next one. I don't know how well they're going to stack but we'll get them into the box somehow. <laughs> and again a little sort of fiddly little detail but I just find these little details a lot of fun to do and people really like them as well so when you're showing someone around your doll's house it's all these little things that are going to pop out to them I don't know how many I'm going to be able to fit in there but I'll do these nine anyway and we'll see if we can squash them all in I've made the little box up there as well and I'm actually going to glue the little cases together and then put them in as a hole. I'm going to need my tweezers for this bit. And if they start to come unfurled you can sort of curl them back up again as you're doing this. in the middle. Okay so I'm just going to put a little bit of glue inside the box. I want to glue them right along the front in front of that little acetate window. See if I can get those in there without them unfurling. and then glue the little lid down. I'm really pleased with those, so I'll just put those on the little baking table there. I left my little tins drying overnight, so I'm now ready to attach the labels. And you want to attach them so that you're leaving a little bit of that silver showing at the top and bottom. I'm just going to trim a little bit of that overhanging paper off. And roll it round in your fingers to make sure that the paper is stuck flat. And there's our first little tin.
So I want to move away from the packets for a moment and I'm going to make some spaghetti and pasta. And I've got these two little jars to fill, so the taller one I'll have for the spaghetti and then we'll do some pasta to go in the smaller one there. So I'll just pop those to one side. So I've just had a little practice to get a sort of similar colour and I'm using, I haven't got much of this one left, but this one is called ochre and it's like a sort of mustardy yellow colour. And then I'm using the translucent white. And I've rolled a little ball here, and that's half and half. Or one part ochre and one part translucent white. And if I sort of hold a piece of the spaghetti against it, the colour match isn't too bad. But when the polymer clay dries, the translucent white actually does turn more translucent, so hopefully it will give it this sort of opaque look. So I'll pop that there for now. Put those over there. So you want to mix up these two together. And I've already warmed these up a little bit while I was rolling them into a ball. And the ochre was really dry, so I had to warm that up quite a bit. So squeeze them together like that. And then you can sort of roll them into a sausage between your hands. And these have got to be all one colour so there's no marbling. So it's really just a question of rolling them into a sausage and then squeezing it back into a ball. And just keep rolling until they all blend into one. Now if you're new to using polymer clay you might like to have a look at my first miniature foods video in which I talk about the tools and materials that I use. So that's nicely blended now and I'm going to mix in the little ball that I made earlier. So I want enough polymer clay to make a jar of spaghetti and a jar of pasta and then I probably want enough to do a couple of boxes or bags of pasta to go in the cupboard. Now I don't know how much this is going to do so once we get to the end we'll see if we've got anything left or if we need to make some more and then I can give you an exact measurement for this ball of clay. At the moment it's about 15 millimetres or 5 eighths of an inch. And I'm just going to cut, I'm going to cut it just under half like that, put that piece to one side and then I want to begin by making the spaghetti. So roll it into a sausage and you can roll it on your tile as well or your surface. I just find these ceramic tiles ideal. For working with clay and I've got another one there which I'm going to use to actually bake these in the oven but you can also use a baking tray just the normal kind um, that you'd use in your kitchen but I would keep it just separate for your polymer clay rather than then going on to use it for baking as well <laughs> And I have mentioned before that polymer clay is toxic. Well, actually it isn't, but it's probably still not a good idea to, you know, use the same tray for them baking on. So I'm just sort of roll, keep rolling it out and then I'm just cutting away the excess. Now, we want this super thin. If you think there's a piece of spaghetti and it's about the same thickness as that, so we want it to be... 12 times thinner than this piece of spaghetti. Now that might be impossible but basically we just want to get it as absolutely thin as we can otherwise it's going to look out of scale like a really sort of chunky spaghetti. Cut that piece off. really want it to be hair thin and even as well all the way along. And if you're finding it difficult to sort of roll and keep it even then you can trim it off like I've done there. Just try 
to pick that up without it breaking. And then what we're actually going to do is bake these whole and then once they've baked we'll cut them. And it's just easier than to do it that way than trying to cut these tiny little strands as we're making them. So that's probably about as thin as I can go and it's not entirely even but the thinnest parts there are as thin as a hair I would say. See if I can just roll that middle bit out while it's in the air. And then I'm just going to carefully lay that on my tile ready to go in the oven. And as well because these are so thin if you're just going to do the spaghetti on its own you probably need to put them in for I don't know five minutes when you're doing a sort of chunkier thicker item it recommends I think up to is it half an hour or yeah maximum of 30 minutes but that would be if you were doing something quite large and we're going to need quite a few pieces to fill the jar It actually helps to keep them even if you use both fingers to roll like that. So I filled my tile and these are now ready to bake. And I really am just going to put them in for probably five to ten minutes. Now there's someone here that I won't be able to use but I think out of these I'll be able to get enough to then fill the jar. But we'll have a look once they've cooked and we've cut them to length. Okay so I'll go and pop these in the oven. So I put these in for seven minutes and that was far too long because they've actually burned and when they burn they go quite dark in colour. So a bit of a disaster really because I'm not going to be able to use these now. So I'll redo them but next time I'm going to put them in probably for about two minutes and then see if after that time they've hardened off enough but the colour has gone sort of like a, a brownish red so they're far too dark now. So I will need to redo them. But luckily I haven't wasted too much polymer clay. So second time around I put these in for three minutes. And they've come out now a much better colour. So they're not completely hard yet. Which is good because I now want to cut them. And I need them to be 20 millimetres long. That's just over three quarters of an inch to fit into my jar. And I want a nice blunt end. So I'm just going to cut the end off one, get rid of that, and then I'll measure that, move that one out of the way. So I cut that one to size and I can use that as my guide. Like that. And then I can cut them all to that size. And they're really easy to cut just with the tip of your knife. These little straggly ones I'm actually going to get rid of. So I've cut my spaghetti into 20 millimetre lengths. Now because these are so fine they break really easy so don't just scoop them all up with the intention of sort of putting them all in together because you might find that they just snap. So though it seems quite long winded <laughs> do just put them in individually. And even though I picked that one up I just chipped a tiny little bit off so just be really careful with them. Final piece there. And put the little lid on. And I trimmed that piece of cork because you find with these the cork tends to stick sort of right up above the jar like that and it doesn't look realistic. So just trim it so that it's flat along the top of the jar. And if you haven't got a jar with a piece of cork, then you can just use a little piece of cork sheet and just cut it into a circle to sit on the top there. I'm quite pleased with that and I think the colour came out quite nicely. So I've got some clay left, probably just over half of the ball left. So I'm going to make the little pasta tubes or penne pasta in the same way as I did the spaghetti but it will just be a little bit thicker and then we'll have a go at making some pasta bows. 
So I've made some more strips here for my pasta tubes and although they're tubes I think that would be pretty impossible in 1 12th scale. So I'm just going to trim these strips to 3 millimetres and that's 1 8th of an inch in length and use those as my penne pasta. And then with this small piece I've got left I want to roll it out and have a go at making some pasta bows. So flatten it down as much as you can. And then I've got here an acrylic roller and that helps to stop the clay from sticking to the roller. But you can also just use a little bit of talc as well. And I've just got some really sort of cheap um, baby talc here. So just put that onto your roller just like you would use flour when you're rolling out pastry. And then roll that out as flat as you can. And I'm just going to cut that off there with the blade and then turn some more of that talc and roll again I think that's pretty thin now and then what I want to do is just use the blade to square this off And then I want to cut this into rectangles of about three by two millimetres. And I'm just going to do that by eye. Get rid of that one a bit uneven and then go across. strip as well. So each of these is now a piece of pasta and the sun has just come out so let me move my tile around. So just start by separating out some of the pieces. And For this next bit I'm using a couple of cocktail sticks but you may have some polymer clay shaping tools like the old dentist tools that you can use. Um, we're really just going to shape the little rectangle into a bow so you're going to squeeze the centre in and you'll need to do that a little bit otherwise you'll just snap it in half it will just sort of break in half so just go in on each edge see like that one did so if you go too hard they'll just break so just really sort of gentle squeeze and I'll move the camera in a bit when I've got a few done and I'll show you close up what I'm doing there so you just want to separate some of the little rectangles away from the main block and then you're just very gently squeezing the centre together like that. too rough with that one, I just broke that one in half. Now if you go and have a look on Google Images and just put in dried pasta you'll find so many different shapes that you could have a go at and different colours as well. There's that lovely green colour, that sort of olive green pasta that you can buy. So do have a little play around with clay colours and shapes. And again, the pasta comes in bags, boxes, jars, so you can have fun there as well. I removed um, a row off the end here because it was actually more square rather than rectangle, so just put them into your little waste pile and then you can use them for something else. It does seem like a time-consuming 
job, but once you sort of get into a rhythm, it'll sort of start flying through. And I'm going to leave these on this tile and put this tile in the oven so I haven't got to then move these onto another tile and risk sort of misshaping them. So these two tiles are now ready to go in the oven and I put the oven on about five minutes ago and I'm just going to put these in again for about three minutes. So these have now baked and I've left them to cool down. Now when you first take them out of the oven they may just be stuck to the tile so just really sort of gently push them along to make sure they're not sticking. Like that. And I've actually already done the bows. And then I, I was going to do the um, pasta tubes in the jar, but I'm actually going to put those in a packet now. And I'm going to use the jar for the little bows because I'm really pleased with how they've come out. So I'll just remove the cork. And again, I cut this cork down because it just didn't look right at the height that it was. And again, I'm going to use the tweezers just to put these into the jar. just because I don't want to scoop them up and risk breaking them. So that's about all I can fit in there. I'm going to push that cork back in like that. And I might do some little labels for these as well. Little labels on string. So they're now ready to go and put back on the unit in the kitchen. I'm now going to trim my penne pasta. I actually just want to cut them to about three millimetres long again, maybe a little bit less, and I'm cutting them on an angle as well. A few of them are flying off but they're just here next to the tile. So I'm just going to see if I can save a bit of time on this by doing maybe three strands together. I want to get rid of that end bit. Slide those off there. So there's all my pieces cut up. And then I've got here a plastic bag which my tweezers came in. So it's attached at the sides and along the bottom. So I'm just going to cut it about there. And this is obviously a lot bigger than I need. But I'm going to fill it and then I'm going to wrap the sides around to make it about 8 millimetres or just under 3 eighths of an inch wide. So I'm just going to scoop these into here. I don't think I'll get any more in there. I'm just trying to curl these sides around. Let's crease those in. Just push all those down. And I want to just bend this top over. Like that. And then I've got here label that I printed off with penne pasta written on the front and I just want to hold the bag together with that label and then before that has a chance to ping open I'm going to glue that down at the back like that and then I've got a little bag of pasta as well just to stand in the cupboard. So I'm going to leave it there for today, but I'm going to need a lot more food packets and tins for my kitchen cupboard. But in the next video I want to show you how to make some pickling jars. So we'll do some pickled onions, pickled veg, pickled eggs, all that sort of thing. And I want to have quite a few jars in my cupboard as well. We can do some jams and marmalades and things like that and have a bit of fun with the scenic water. So once I've made all of the packets that I need to fill my cupboard, this is my cupboard here, I'll actually be gluing those all into place. 
but we'll do that in another video and we can talk about how to display the items as well. I really hope you've enjoyed this video and that it's given you a few ideas for your own kitchen cupboards. If you do enjoy making your own doll's house miniatures and furniture, do have a look at my books. I've published five of them so far and they're all available to purchase from Amazon. Just search for Julie Warren. And for now, thank you for watching and I'll see you again soon.